At the end of the last video, we saw that we could rotate points around the origin with a matrix, a linear transformation, but we didn't know how to generate that matrix for any particular rotation that we wanted. By the end of this video, you're going to know how to construct a 2D rotation matrix for any angle you want, some special properties the rotation matrix has that are helpful to us, and how to start applying it in three dimensions, since our robots live in a 3D world. Let's go! Remember, we're looking for a 2x2 two two matrix that whenever we multiply it by a point, x1, y1, rotates that point around the origin anti-clockwise by an angle of our choosing, to make a new point, x2, y2. I'll refer to this as r theta, since it'll change depending on the angle we choose. If you're in a rush and you need the answer right now, here it is. r theta is cos theta, minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta. You could leave now and go and rotate all the points you want, but I promise it's worth sticking around to learn how they work. Deriving this matrix isn't too hard. We'll start by adding some extra variables to make life easier. We'll add h, the distance from the point to the origin, the hypotenuse of this little triangle, and phi, the angle the hypotenuse makes with the x-axis. Now we can write x1, y1 as h cos phi, h sine phi, and we can do a similar thing for x2 and y2 except it'll be phi plus theta. We can expand the second one out using trig identities, substitute the original points back in, and pull the coefficients out to turn it into a matrix multiplication. And there we go, we've matched what we were looking for. That 2x2 two two matrix is the 2D rotation matrix. You can multiply it by any point or series of points joined together as a matrix to rotate them anti-clockwise around the origin by an angle theta. In the description, you'll find a link to a demo you can try for yourself, as well as some example code. Before we move on to 3D rotations, there's a few important properties of rotation matrices that we should know. They might seem a bit trivial to begin with, but as we work with more complex equations and many matrices, they're going to save a lot of headaches. The proofs I'll show are a little bit hand-wavy and only cover the 2D case, but the same properties do apply in 3D and even higher dimensions. The first thing to know is that the inverse of a rotation matrix is its transpose. Sometimes computing the inverse of a matrix can be a difficult or even impossible task, but not for rotation matrices. If r theta is the matrix for some rotation, then if we want to invert this rotation, that's the same as unrotating the point, or equivalently, to rotate it by an angle minus theta. Then, using the fact that the cosine function is even, cos of minus theta equals cos theta, and the sine function is odd, sine of minus theta equals minus sine theta, we can see that this is just the transpose of the original matrix. Being able to undo a rotation this easily is very handy, especially in 3D. We're going to use this a lot. The second property is that the determinant of all rotation matrices is equal to 1, no matter what the value of theta is. Again, this is pretty straightforward to prove using the equation for the determinant of a 2D matrix and some standard trig identities. Thirdly, rotation matrices have the property that if you multiply two of them together, you always get another rotation matrix. That is, you get another matrix that has those same first two properties, and which would represent a different rotation in space. For 2D, this seems pretty obvious. Of course, rotating by one angle and then another is the same as rotating the sum of the angles. Again, we can prove this using trig identities, and as expected for the 2D example, we get the sum of the angles. For 3D, the result will still be a rotation matrix, it'll still have these other properties and represent a combined rotation, but as we'll soon see, it's not so simple as adding two numbers. One other thing worth noting is that the fancy mathematical name for the group of all rotation matrices is the special orthogonal group for a particular dimension n. You might sometimes see it written that a matrix is in SO2 or SO3. This simply means it's a rotation matrix in 2D or 3D respectively, so it'll have all those properties and some more. Speaking of 3D, what do 3D rotations look like? It's an important question since the world we live and operate in is in three dimensions. If you're tracking well so far, you might be thinking that 3D rotations are only a little bit harder than 2D. Well, you're sort of right and sort of wrong. Really truly getting your head around 3D rotations is actually very difficult, and we'll look at that in some future videos. But fortunately, the basics are actually pretty simple once you've got 2D down pat. What you might have already realised is that if we take a look at our 2D plane in 3D space, we can see that there is a secret z-axis sticking out of the page, 
and our 2D rotation is actually just a rotation around that z-axis. The 3x3 matrix describing this rotation will be similar to the 2x2 one, we just need an extra column and row. We know that the z-value of any points will just stay the same, here they're at 0, and they won't have any impact on the x and y values. The way we achieve this is by putting a 1 in that bottom right corner, and zeros along the edges, that keeps the z the same and it doesn't affect anything else. Before we look at other 3D rotations, we should make sure we're aware of two different rules, confusingly both called the right hand rule. The first one is that if you point your right thumb along the positive x-axis, and index finger along the positive y-axis, then lift up your middle finger, it will be pointing along the positive z-axis. If you use your left hand instead, then all your numbers will come out backwards. Now, this is actually used in some systems, it's particularly common in video game engines, which can make them annoying to integrate with, but in maths and robotics and these videos, we usually assume a right-handed coordinate system. The other thing you can see here is the colour convention that is often used. X is red, Y is green, and Z is blue. We also have the right-hand grip rule, which says if we grip an axis with our right hand and our thumb sticking in the positive direction, then the direction our fingers curl in is the positive rotation. I use these aids all the time in my daily work and they'll crop up again in future videos. So we can rotate around the z-axis, what about the other two coordinate axes? You might want to go derive them yourselves like we did for z, but here's the short answer. Firstly, for the rotation about a given axis, we know the point's position along that axis will stay the same, it's not affected by other axes and it won't affect them. So we can put a 1 in the position along the diagonal for that axis and fill in the rest of its row and column with zeros. Next, we fill in the other diagonals with cos theta. And the last bit is the tricky bit. We'll fill the last two spaces in each matrix with a sine theta. But then we need to make sure we get the negative sign in the right spot. The way I remember is that the row below the 1 has a negative in it. And for a z, that wraps around, so the first row is negative. Once we fill those in, we're done. We can do rotations around x, or y, or z. But are we really done? This is all well and good if we want to rotate exactly around one of the main coordinate axes, but it doesn't really help us if we want to rotate arbitrarily in 3D space around the origin. There are actually a few different ways to think about this, and as I mentioned earlier, it gets pretty complicated. So for now, we'll just touch on the most straightforward approach, multiple rotations. You see, there's a rule that says any coordinate rotation in 3D space can be achieved with no more than three sequential rotations around the primary axes. For example, that rotation before could be achieved by first rotating 20 degrees around the z-axis, then 30 around y, and then 40 around x. You can make it work for any axis order, and you can even use the same axis twice for the first and last ones. For example, z, y, z gives us the same result. To create the complete rotation matrix, we're going to build it up by multiplying the individual rotation matrices together. And something to be really careful of here is the order. That first rotation we saw was around Z, then Y, then X. We say Z, Y, X, but you see the order of the matrices is going to have to be X, Y, Z, because it's the one on the right that will apply to the points first and then work its way out. These are called extrinsic rotations. In later videos, we're going to see the use of intrinsic rotations, where we do put the matrices in the order we say them. This will give us a different result, where the coordinate axes seem to move with the points. So that extrinsic ZYX rotation is the same as an intrinsic XYZ rotation. If we reset and then slowly adjust the values in that order, we see that the first rotation is around X, as we expect, then the next rotation is around where Y used to be, see the green dot, and then finally Z is around where it used to be. The top face of that cube is staying in the same plane. Same equations, same result, two different ways of thinking about it. If your mind is feeling a bit blown right now, don't worry, that's completely normal. We've got a whole video digging into these ideas coming up soon. When we split a 3D rotation up into three angles, 99% of the time we call them Euler angles. 
even though historically the terminology is a bit more complex. Figuring out how to break down that rotation into the correct Euler angles, or doing a smooth rotation over time between locations, are both outside the scope of this video. But most of the time, we can actually construct our problems so that we're only rotating around one axis at a time. For example, this robot arm has a few different links, and the end effector is in an arbitrary orientation. But by looking at the rotation of individual joints, you can see that the links are only ever rotated around a single axis relative to their parent. Of course, they're also translated, which is what we're going to be looking at in the next video. But you can see how each of these individual transformations all chain together to produce the final result. There's a link to this simple 3D demo in the description. And down there, you'll also find links to the discussion thread for this video and my Patreon page. If you find this video helpful, please consider supporting through Patreon. Thanks especially to Anonymous and Matt Williamson for their support. And remember to hit subscribe so that you don't miss the rest of this series. All right, see you next time.